Thanks, Kerry. I'm going to share screen. Oh, hello. Uh -huh. Lovely. Brilliant. So, hi, everybody. I'm Sue Atwell. I'm co lead for GIST National Centre for AI and Tertiary Education. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, National Centre and uh, what we do, and look at where we are now, then dip into assessment, student perceptions, and then move into an activity. So the National Centre for AI and Tertiary Education, and hopefully that's the last time I'm going to say that. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it is our name. And uh, we were set up about two years ago to accelerate the adoption of AI across the tertiary education sector in a responsible way. Responsible for us is quite a key word. Um, to an extent, the acceleration and awareness has been done by um, all the media and the uh, rise of uh, generative AI tools. But so we've kind of split that to support the sector, but in a responsible way. So we like to think that we are making the sector aware of both the positives and the negatives and supporting them to make informed choices. And we do this in a few ways. We do a lot of thought leadership. We run some pilots and evaluate them. We provide a lot of practical advice, guidance and training. We do some influencing, so working with people like DFE and Devolved Nations, and we have a very active community. So the report for AI and tertiary education is one of our thought leadership pieces, something we produce annually. The third edition has just been published, um, September 2023, and we'll revisit that and aim to publish 2024 version in summer. But what that does is capture what AI is at that point in time. So what's happening across AI, what's happening in the sector, and where we're starting to see emerging use cases and case studies of good practice. And just sharing some of our pilots. So we piloted body swaps, which is a VR AR inter intersection tool. And we piloted that directly with students. So we did a roadshow type approach. And um, it allows students, so the module we chose to pilot was uh, around employability and supporting students with interviews. So students could go through an interview in VR. They could then swap bodies into the interviewer's body and see how they came across and get AI feedback on how to improve their performance. And also has a lot of well-being and medical um, modules within it. And we're starting to see more and more VR AI tools come, and particularly around the medical space. Anyways, we've just finished piloting that. And that was um, quite a nice little tool that just uses AI to create audio resources, podcast type materials from your existing content. So another form of learning for the student with very little effort on the part of the uh, tutor teacher. And Teachamatic, we're just piloting at the moment. So in mid-pilot, we have eight colleges piloting this, and we've just started a HE pilot. And this really is the area we're seeing a lot of growth at the moment. So this is almost a kind of mid-person. So this is a tool that sits on top of OpenAI, but it, in this case, it allows the teacher to produce a lot of useful resources, things like lesson plans, FAQs, um, multiple choice questions, learning materials, without having to develop prompting skills for themselves. They can simply click on a box, add the URL, a couple of other, answer a few questions, set the level, and it'll go away and it'll create them. Um, one of the really useful things I like about this particular tool is that it allows you to set things like accessibility so you can tell it that you need the resources to be created because you have a student who is dyslexic and you, or you have a student that is neuro neurodivergent and it will adapt resources to cater for those particular needs, which then of course allows those resources to be um, available for all students because we all know that a lot of students find accessibility resources really helpful, even though they might not officially have those needs. I mentioned the word responsible, and um, 
this is some guidance we put out and we're just in the process of refreshing this going forwards. But this is really about a set of guidelines for institutions to go through before thinking about bringing AI into their institution. So making sure that people are doing it for the right reasons, that they've gone through the process of thinking about, you know, does this use fit with our purpose and culture? Are we ready to do this? Do the staff have the necessary skills to implement it? And does AI raise any specific issues? You know, have we got the right consents in place? Are our students the right age? You know, can they use this? And then practical training. So we've got two mini MOOCs online at the moment. Uh, we'll be adding to this shortly, but an introduction to generative AI. So just practical course into what it is, how it works, and then another one into AI and ethics. And they're both um, short. Um, they're on a monthly basis. They've got very active forums as part of it. Um, they're proving very popular and they're free to GIST members. And we're just at the moment working with our building digital capabilities tool. So people who use that tool will shortly see an AI section embedded within that tool just to expand its offering. And then this has probably been our most downloaded publication. Um, we're very obvious with our names, as you can see. So Generative AI Primer, it's exactly what it says. If you've never used Generative AI tools, this is your starting point. It'll talk you through how to get started, the kind of things that's good to start with, considerations, what not to do, um, how to do things like how to use it to create images. It's really good, um, really simple, really clear, and we've had lots of really good feedback on it. And I mentioned we've got an active community. We run monthly-ish community meetups. Um, I know these dates are out of date, but um, the QR codes will take you to sign up for the next sessions, which will be in January. We're not doing any December meetups. Christmas, of course, is much more important. So looking at where we are now. So we've had generative AI around for since 2018. And it was just quietly developing in that normal, slow development phase that all technologies go through. And then in 2021, we started to see generative image tools come on, which started to spark a bit of interest. Then we had a few more of those tools and a bit further development in 2022. And that interest started to build. And then we had ChatGPT in November 2022, which just blew interest out of the water. And then in 2023, we've had lots of uh, new announcements. They continue to come. And that's the thing that's different with this. It's a technological development. It's a new tool like any other tool. But the sheer speed of change is outside anything we've experienced before. And we're not seeing any signs of that slowing down at the moment. So that presents a particular challenge. So, sorry, I thought I was going to sneeze then. Chat GPT, uh, so just looking at that um, specific, so this is the free version I'm talking about now. It was created by a company called OpenAI. Contrary to its name, it's not open. It is a commercial company and other competitors do exist. It's trained on large chunks of the internet plus some books. Humans help with the training by providing feedback. So every time we use it and we use things like the thumbs up, thumbs down, they're helping it to improve. And all it's really doing is predicting the next words based on the sequence of preceding words which sounds quite simple, but is actually quite effective. It can write plausible sounding text on any topic. So if you've never used it before, please use it to explore a topic you know enough about to judge whether the outputs are correct or not. For all these tools, the human review part is critical. I would never use any output from any tool without reviewing it first myself. It can generate answers to a range of questions, including coding, maths, multiple choice, and it's getting increasingly accurate and sophisticated with every release. 
It's also getting increasingly expensive. And it will generate unique text every time you use it. So when people talk about things like um, ChatGPT passed the law exam today, I wonder quite how many times they have to try before it passed. And if they just tried again five minutes later, it would have failed. It's great at a wide range of tasks, particularly things like text summarization, changing the tone of things. So limitations. It can and often does generate plausible but incorrect information. And this can include false references and false claims about its capability. So when we had these tools first um, talked about, we'd, I sometimes see things on Twitter that would make me cringe. You know, I see teachers saying something like, well, I put my students' work into ChatGPT and it told me to generated it. It mostly will claim authorship of practically anything you choose to put in and ask it the question, did you write this? Um, it likes to say, yes, it did. It has no clue whether it did or not. Um, and what you've probably done if you do that is given the student's work to a generative AI tool training model. So um, ChatGPT, the free version, is only knowledgeable up to January 2022. It knows absolutely nothing since then because it has no access to the internet. So concerns, we mentioned it's trained on uh, large chunks of the internet and a few books. Large chunks of the internet includes large elements of things like Reddit forums. So it can and does produce biased output, culturally, politically, every kind of way you can think of really. And the free version, it can generate unacceptable outputs occasionally. It's got high environmental impact, so large water and power use. And there are some concerns around the human impact. A lot of human training and fine tuning is done on these models. That's often done by poorly paid people in the developing world. And there's a danger of increasing digital inequity, which we'll explore later. But generative AI is much more than ChatGPT. And these are the six most common uses at the moment in education. So chat, search, images, coding, writing, and content generation. And these are just a few of the examples of tools that are out there. But there's many, many, many more out there. So just an example. ChatGPT Plus, that's the paid for version, currently $20 a month, has several hundred plugins growing all the time. But it has some really useful plugins, particularly for education. So things like Wolfram, which is a really good maths tool, and Scholar AI, a really good research tool. Lots of examples. And again, we're looking at that digital inequity. So we, we blogged about this a um, couple of weeks ago. There's more information on our blog site. But just coming back to that issue of ethics and um, T's and C's. Is everything you're putting into these models being used to train the model? Well, um, our blog goes into more examples with ChatGPT. It does unless you opt out. With Google Bard, all your inputs are used to train it. With Anthropic, Nothing is used unless you specifically opt in. And with Bing Chat, your, your inputs are used to train the model. Now, if you are a Microsoft institution, you will have noticed recently that, um, and if you've got E3 or E5 licenses, that you've probably got Bing Chat Enterprise. And if you've got Bing Chat Enterprise, Please use that because that means that it's covered under your standard enterprise license. Inputs are not used to train the model. IP remains with the institution and uh, it's a much safer offer. And there's an age requirement which differs according to sites, which again, you know, can be an issue, particularly for colleges that are dealing with under 18 students. Obviously, can't control what they're using, but it's something to bear in mind when suggesting usage around that age limit. And the speed of change. We're still getting announcements all the time. So we had 
GPTs introduced about two weeks ago, where you can create your custom versions of a GP, chat GPT. And again, we've got a new blog that's just gone online today, um, talking through how to do this. And last week we had the announcement that chat GPT plus and um, has now gone um, voice enabled. So you can chat to it just in the same way as you do Alexa and Siri. So we're now in a space that we're calling everyday AI, and that's because AI is getting integrated into our everyday tools. So, you know, when you pick your phone up and do facial recognition, it's AI that's doing that recognition. You know, if you're using the, the designer element of Microsoft PowerPoint, it's AI that's suggesting those designs. It's AI that's, um, again, you know, I use Google Mail, Gmail for my uh, personal um, communications and every time I go to do a new email it asks me if I want help writing it and I can choose yes or I can choose no but it's just starting to be a part of our everyday life so it's getting increasingly hard to take an avoid approach to this. As I mentioned Google so now within Google Docs if you open up a new Google Doc you get a little thing which asks again you know would you like help writing and you can choose yes or no and if you choose yes then you get this little pencil and star and you can put in what you like so here we put in write an intro to ai in education just a very simple request and it's produced a page of text within about half a minute and then it allows you to uh, refine it so as then button an arrow at the bottom that says so recreate you can say try again don't like that um, we talked before about it giving you unique output every time you ask so you can just recreate and it will try again or you can refine you can ask it to change the tone to be more friendly to be more creative so you know these tools are starting really easy and really helpful in reducing some workload and I thought I'd just focus in on Gamma.app, which is not one of the big four, but is a really useful tool. So hopefully this is going to play. So you'll see it produces PowerPoints. You can say, I would like AI help. I want a presentation. Put in your topic. I did this the other week to have a play. And I asked it to do employability skills for students in 2030, because that's my old job. And um, it will then come up with a suggested structure. So when I did this, I changed the order of a couple of those bullet points because I thought it worked better that way around. You can then choose your format or not, it will surprise you. And then this is real time, it's just screen recording. It produces PowerPoint decks with appropriate images and with things like graphs and visuals. So for me, it created a very snazzy, I would say, PowerPoint, probably better than some of my PowerPoints. This is one of my PowerPoints, so you can judge. Um, but I then spent 20 minutes reviewing that and I made a few changes. And then I would have been quite happy delivering that presentation. I mean, that human review is key. I would never ever take any kind of output and just think, okay, job done. But what that had done is enable me to create a PowerPoint I would have been happy delivering in around 35 minutes. When I'm creating um, my standard PowerPoints like this one, probably a couple of hours, maybe a little bit more if you get lost down that black hole of looking for appropriate pictures, we must all do that, surely it's not just me. Um, but that's quite a time saving for me. You know, that's a huge chunk of time that I can then do something that's probably a lot more valuable than creating PowerPoints. Bing Chat and ChatGPT can now read pictures, so you can do things like put a diagram in and ask it for suggestions for how to improve it to make it more accessible or just how to make it more easily easy to understand. So what we're seeing across the sector, we've seen a lot of focus around assessment and policy. We've seen initial assessment guidance for students produced and some good examples. We're seeing staff starting to use it for process work, so things like um, grant applications, lesson planning. We're starting to see early thinking about how to use it in learning and teaching, how to think about it more creatively. We've seen widespread use by students 
and broad acknowledgement that work will change, but limited action on that at the moment. We're increasingly starting to see AI within assistive technology. Um, and that's a thing to be uh, really careful about when writing student guidance and thinking about an approach. If you outright ban all AI, you will be banning a lot of accessibility tools because they use AI to work, things like Grammarly. And, a, and AI and accessibility is coming, coming on really well. So things like screen readers, automatic captioning, uh, voice to text are getting much more accurate all the time. So looking at assessment, we've obviously got this spectrum. What's acceptable, what's not acceptable is something we're encouraging all, ex all institutions to discuss. It is not for us to decide what's acceptable, what isn't. It will vary across institutions and a lot of the time it will vary across subject. What might work in one will not necessarily be allowed in another. But we had lots of not necessarily helpful press in that when ChatGPT first came, you know, about it killing off homework, killing off exams, a lot of doom mongering probably. But when we talk about assessment, contrary to the media explosion, you know, the idea of changing assessment is not new. It's been around as long as I can remember, if I'm honest. People have been talking about the need to change assessment and make better assessment design. And just capturing this from a report that was written in 2020, you know, pre-generative AI calling for change. There's three re real tactics. So you can choose to avoid, which means that the real, only real option is in-person, handwritten exams. Not very good for student well-being, lot of resource implications, not very good in moving to better assessment design. You can try and outrun, which means you need to devise an assessment that AI can't do. However, AI is advancing so rapidly and changing so much that if you take that route, you have to be prepared to continually refine your assessment because what AI can't do now, it probably will be able to do in three weeks. So you're taking on a huge workload if you take that route. Adapt and embrace is the model we are um, promoting as a centre. And as GIS, where you're embracing the, the use of AI and starting to think about how to redesign assessment, starting to think about things like authentic assessment. I mean, I think we're all here for the same reason, which is really to best support students. And students are effectively living in an AI enabled world and they're moving into work or more study in an AI enabled world. So I have to think about how we support them best to thrive and move into sustainable employment in that world. So is it possible to detect AI? Short answer is no, long answer is well, kind of, but not that effectively. So there isn't any system today that can conclusively prove anything's been written by AI. Of the ones that are around, Turnitin is the most effective. It's low 70% 70, low 70 effective. So around 26, 28, 29% uh, false positives, which is a huge workload, um, a huge requirement around investigation. And one of the concerns is that a lot of students are using AI to uh, improve their writing. That's how I use it a lot. Um, I write very passively, so I use AI to make my writing more engaging and to help me improve my writing. And if you use AI to get feedback and improve your writing, it's high. And also, this is particularly an issue for students who are non-native speakers, where they're using things to make sure they're writing things correctly. AI will pick up their writing style as being the same as an AI writing style because it's very, very similar. So they are, um, it's unfairly biased against non-native speakers. All of the techniques can be defeated and they'll all give false positives. So bearing all that in mind, one of the things we thought we might do is to come up with a um, 
practical resource into how to think about changing assessment. So we did this interactive PowerPoint and it was one of our working groups from our community that, that developed this, led by um, Isabel Bowditch at U UCL and developed with colleagues from a range of universities, came up with this idea of how to change assessment. So there's around 46 different types of assessment here. It relates to Bloom's taxonomy and they're all rated on some key characteristics and where it's appropriate. So this is the assessment categories the toolkit breaks it down to for things like control condition exams, practical exams, quizzes and in-class tests and open book exams. And if you click on one of those categories it will then take you to this they're all colour coded, but if you click on open book, it will take you to this purple slide and you can then choose one of those categories. In this example, I chose visualise a concept down on the bottom left and this is the card it'll give. And at any stage in the kit, you can click on either go back onto the open book category or back to the index and explore. And there's around, I think, 46, 48 different suggestions on that. And then just looking at student perceptions. So last spring, we did a range of student discussion forums with both college and university students, and then produced this report, Student Perceptions of Generative AI. And we're currently in the process of updating that. So I'm running a range of student forums between now and February, having those discussions to find out what students are doing and what their hopes and wishes and concerns are now. So how are students using ChatGPT and other generative AI tools? So this is the picture when we did these last spring, which was around research tools, exploring concepts, getting started, you know, getting over that blank sheet of paper, making suggestions for them about different th types of things they might consider, to give them structure, particularly where they've never had to do a certain thing before to get feedback on their writing and as a safe proofreading element. Students, particularly non-native speakers, are using it for translation and rewriting sections. And they're doing that because of how it works. It works on a very conversational style. So the student can ask the same question in a different way if it doesn't understand. So they're often using it to get an understanding of what's being asked for them to make sure they can respond appropriately. Um, you know, they can ask the same question 18 times in 18 different ways to get that understanding. Most students don't feel confident and that they can do that of a tutor or in class where there's peers. So it just makes it really easy for them to have that interaction and support at any time of the day. They're using it to iterate and discuss and to create images to support things like portfolios and occasionally they were using it for Post it, paste in a question and get the answer out. Things seem to have moved on with this round. We're early in this round. I don't want to be too precise, but it feels like students have moved on from using it as an answering tool, something that they can ask it and it will give them the answers, to learning it as to using it as quite a sophisticated learning resource. So they're using it to dive to to deepen and broaden their depth of knowledge. Um, by interrogating it and exploring concepts that it suggests that, that are interesting to them. They use it to develop their own revision materials. So they use it for things like develop a revision quiz and things like that. So it feels like we're starting to transition into a new phase. Student concerns, they're concerned about things like their information literacy skills. As a nation, we don't teach information literacy very early. In places like the Netherlands and some of the um, Scandinavian countries, they teach it at primary age. So data security, they're concerned about safeguarding their own privacy and also IP and ownership. If they're putting things in like their creative students to work on their own photography, for example, who owns it if it's gone through a generative AI tool? 
they would like staff to use these tools, but if they are using them to create things like lesson materials, they would like transparency. But they, they're, they're keen that staff do use these tools because they want staff to feel confident. They want to feel they can ask staff questions and get confident responses. They're concerned that there is no over-reliance on generative AI because they do want to continue to learn. They want to make sure they do have intellectual development in their learning. And they're really concerned about the future and the skill development and the potential impact. And just one of the things they're concerned about is digital inequity. So just looking at things like um, free chat GPT versus paid for chat GPT, and the difference is $20 a month. It's quite a high cost, really. Um, GPT Plus has guardrails, so it doesn't produce unreasonable outputs. It's up to date. It can search the internet so you can get um, a lot more information you can't get on chat GPT. And it has many more plugins. So it's really good for some educational tools, you know, things like maths, coding, STEM, really good for those kind of things. And it can now do things like analyze documents. So we're starting to see a potential widening of that digital divide, which is no good thing. And then just expanding that to include things like accessibility. Um, I doubt any student would need all of these tools, but you could see that a student might need GPT Plus and Grammarly, which is £26 a month. It's quite steep. Um, you know, how do we balance this? So student needs, what are they looking for? They're asking for more information, digital literacy, employability skills focus. They want, they would like institution recommendations on what tools to use and how to use them. At the moment, there's a lot of um, and clarity from students where they, even where there are policies, they're like, I don't really understand them or it's different in, in the here to here. So I don't really know what I'm supposed to use. So they really would like very clear guidance and policy. They would like practical training, but they'd like to understand the future as well as the now. And they see this as important. They're really keen to contribute to the conversations. And then just looking at that thing about student concerns and skills of the future, we're starting to see a change in the employability skills we've talked about for a while. And we're starting to see things moving into employers valuing things like analytical judgment, flexibility and emotional intelligence. We're starting to see a focus on things like curiosity, creativity and critical thinking. The human skills which are going to be important, whatever the um, vocational area and whatever, however the AI develops, because these are skills that AI doesn't have. They're in, intrinsically human by nature and they're getting increasingly valued by employers. Analytical thinking people with creativity, according to the World Economic Forum. Leadership skills, people who can influence and work well with others. And then I think importantly, workers who will need to constantly gain new skills throughout their working life. We're starting to see that cycle of moving through jobs speed up. You know, really, we need to be producing learners who know how to learn and like to learn. And that's the best way to support them to thrive. And on that note, I was going to stop for questions. I'm just leaving that QR code up for a minute, just because that's the way to join our mailing list and also the link to our website, which is where all the resources I've mentioned are. They're all on the web page. And then I'll flip back. So I was just going to stop for a moment for questions and then start again on activity. Are there any questions? Mike. Yeah, I mean, lots of people have this idea, you know, think, pair, share, put something in, edit it, do something, discuss it. But you can ask uh, the AI to do all that. You can say, create something, then 
criticize it. You can give it a rubric to criticize it. You can give it a persona and say, how would this person view it? And so you can do the whole thing with AI and pretend it was done by students. The thing I would say to that, Mike, is if you're determined to cheat, you will cheat. You know, you can currently do that before AI came out. You could use things like essay mills, you could copy. You know, part of this is about whether we trust our students or not and knowing our students. It's it's just another tool that's in the mix to allow if students want to, you know, my discussions with students indicate most of them don't want to cheat. They want to learn. They understand that cheating is cheating themselves. I know that's, you know, well, probably not the answer you were looking for, but I think this is not new. It's not a new problem. It's just a different lens on it. And it's the same issues, if I'm honest, that came up when the internet came out and people started using Google. Right. But what I'm saying is you can get around that. You can get them to record what they're doing and submit the whole thing. So you can see the interaction with the AI and how they're prompting and what's coming back. Wow. I don't think that would be very good for student well-being. Um, but hey, yes, it's an option. Victor. Victor, your microphone is ah, OK. Um, he said it'll pop it into chat for you, Sue. OK. Whilst um, Victor is writing that, somebody popped. Um, oh, he's popped it in now. Um, I'll, I'll read it out loud um, for the recording so we can hear it. Just wondering if there are plans for a research pack to help institutions to learn what their students and staff think. We run a survey and a focus group within my department, but perhaps no need to reinvent the wheel. So we're currently running another round of student um, discussion forums and we'll update our student report in the spring. Um, so I think there's various of these activities happening and I know some institutions have been doing similar, but uh, whether there's a thing about pulling those together, that might be something to look at. Yeah. Somebody above also asked a question um, specifically, it's about like the surveys. Rory said, um, how have you gathered these views from learners and are they FE, HE and how many have you gathered? So they were a mix when we did them before. Uh, we, dis we gathered them by talking to students, so student discussion forums, a lot of students in a room and having a chat using Miro, things like that. That's how we're redoing them. So we're currently in the process of um, running the whole series, college and university students. So students are anonymous and everything's aggregated. Is that reason to, well, so we did them earlier this year and produced the report. We're now doing it again, Rory, to update the report in spring. So both. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sue. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now for us, okay? Yep.